So you must have covered uh, the bacterial and viral infections. And uh, this builds on to that lecture, immune response to infectious agents. And today we are going to cover on parasitic and fungal infections. It is happening. All right. Um, I want to take you through the, your learning objectives, which you could have also covered a bit during the time you were going through the bacterial and viral infections. And the outline in any aspect of your understanding of immune response to infectious agents, you have to learn how the immune system will respond to the particular pathogen in question. If you're talking about bacterial, if you're talking about viral, today we are talking about parasites and fungal infections. Now, on the angle of talking about how the immune system will respond to these pathogens, you must be clear on distinguishing the innate arm of the immune response to these pathogens, and then you go to the adaptive arm of these, uh, the immune response to these pathogens. That would be followed uh, uh, immediately with the tissue damage. Now, in this case, we talk about the immunopathology of the infectious agents. So today we are going to cover the immunopathology of the parasitic and fungal infections. Last time, you must have covered the immunopathology of the bacterial and viral infections. So you build from your understanding of how the immune system reacts to these pathogens, then come to understanding of how the immune response to these pathogens may end up causing now the disease. Per se, and this relates also to what you covered in bacterial and viral infections. And again, we'll see it today here in immune response to the parasitic infections that it is not per se the parasite itself that is causing the tissue damage, but the immune system responding to that parasite is the one that is causing the tissue damage. Hence, the immunopathology is related to the immune response to that pathogen in question. Then you must also understand the strategies which are used by these pathogens. Today, we are going to cover the parasites and the fungal infection, the strategies they use to evade the immune response. So immune response is mounted. Then in responding to these pathogens, the tissue is damaged. Then you understand the pathology of it. But over and above, then you'll be understanding how the pathogens in question evade the immune response. In my slides of the immune response to uh, parasitic infections, I think I must have covered some aspect of the uh, pathology then going to the in-depth of the immune response. So we've identified those, path those parasites, we've classified them, then we are going to look at how do they cause the tissue damage and then we'll come back to in-depth of how the immune system responds to them before we conclude with their evasion mechanisms. May I repeat that, that in my slides of the parasitic uh, immune uh, response, we have classified the parasite, and then I went to the um, tissue damage before I came into in-depth of the immune response to them. Like I mentioned to you, immune response, you have to categorize as the uh, innate and adaptive immune response. I don't know what somebody is doing what. <clears throat> so in parasitology, parasites are divided into two categories, the first being the protozoans and then the helminths. Further, the protozoans are divided into intracellular protozoans and also extracellular protozoans. When you look at the intracellular protozoans, we have those which invade the red blood cells, typical of Plasmodium falciparum, and those which can reside in macrophage. So this will be looking at them in them, and especially when we come now to strategies of the immune invasion mechanisms. But at this point, straight away, you'll be understanding the red blood cells are annucleated. And therefore, if you find out the plasmodium falciparum residing in the red blood cells, the red blood cells would have inherent in, in 
capacity to present the pathogen to the effector T cells. And in that case, the red blood cells would be uh, depleted. No wonder you'd be understanding about anemia in patients who are infected with the uh, plasmodium falciparum because the red blood cells is incapacitated to present the pathogen to the effector T cells. And in turn, the red blood cells become now killed. I don't understand why this is delaying me. So one thing you need to understand about the parasite immunology is that when you don't have susceptibility to that parasite, definitely the, 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 the host will not be infected. So exposure to that parasite, susceptibility to that parasite, uh, entails you coming into contact. The UI exposure to that parasite will ensure that you are infected, not you as the students, but um, a patient or a host is infected by that parasite. This is typical of all parasites. We, be you talking about the trichobilhazia, be you talk about, uh, say, the plasmodium falciparum, which I've just mentioned, or other any other uh, parasite. The host susceptibility will occur and you see the parasite will survive in the host and then can cause a disease. But if there is no host uh, susceptibility, which means insusceptibility, the parasite definitely will be killed by the innate immunity. And at that point, everything will be closed. Typical example is insusceptibility to level stages of bad cystosomes, the trichobilhazia. Uh, if there is insusceptibility, then the human beings would not develop the bil bilhazia. But be, because you can get exposed at the point when you are swimming, you have not picked this trichobilhazia, but then you can get what is called the swimmer's itch. And in this case, it is more or less related to how much were you exposed to, the, to this parasite in question. And like I've mentioned, you can have a spontaneous cure, which means the closure of this immune response can be terminated at the level of the innate immune response. So here we talk about spontaneous cure where the parasite establishes, but eventually is expelled by the innate immune response. Typical example is Nipostrongulus brasiliens. But when you get the tripo, uh, Nipostrongulus brasiliens releasing protective antigens, which is not stage dependent, in that case, therefore, they will deter the immune response towards them. So the antibodies will be produced, which can recognize the targets on both adult and uh, migrating infective ones. But nonetheless, you'll find out the exposure has enabled the parasite to establish an infection and will therefore proceed to an injurious stage. So I've mentioned to you, I'm repeating that parasite susceptibility is key and parasites successfully adapt to innate and acquired immune responses of the host. And many factors uh, are um, influencing this, or many factors are involved in host susceptibility, typical being the genetic background of an individual. If an individual is immunocompromised, or if an individual has got inherent uh, uh, variation in the uh, major histocompatibility complex molecules, like I've mentioned to you, you have the red blood cells which are enucleated. And in that case, you definitely know they would not be expressing the major histocompatibility complex molecules which can present the antigen. So your genetic, the genetic background can influence the uh, susceptibility to the parasite. Again, the age factor, you have got the old and the young more susceptible to parasitic infections because of the either in the old stage or old age, the immune system has been weakened or is weaker as compared to you, the youthful age, or you find uh, the children whose immune system are still evolving. And in that case, therefore, you would be understanding that they are more susceptible to the development of, or uh, the pathology which would be caused by the parasite. Nutritional status, I do not need to talk about that because if you don't have good nutrition, then the immune system is not going to be much more protective and you can be susceptible to the parasitic infection. How about the hormonal status? Sometimes back I kept on asking myself, I mean, how does hormonal status really res, uh, relate to the parasitic infection? Then later it became discovered that, you know, men are very much aggressive. The reason being, and 
uh, I would say uh, courageous, not that ladies are not courageous, but you find men venturing in even uh, terrains which are uh, quite uh, precarious. Talk for instance, exposure to the um, beach, uh, um, which one can I give you example? The exposure to beach where you can easily construct, contract Bilhazia and you find they would be going fishing, they would be going to, um, activities close to where the parasite is much more inf uh, infested. And this is influenced to the aggressive uh, nest, which is uh, built in the male, male factor and related much more to the presence of high levels of testosterone as a hormone. Ladies don't have this, so they much more remain docile as compared to the aggressiveness of the uh, the, the men. So this is the relationship between the hormonal status and the susceptibility to the parasitic infections. And when the immune system uh, is being mounted to the parasitic infections, we first have to come down to understanding, is there really any evidence of the immune uh, response to the parasitic infections? Yes, one, you have got the prevalence of infection declining with age. So you have childhood, children could be much more um, you know, infected with parasites, but with time you find your immune system building up and at the youthful stage, you get much less infection with parasites than the uh, ch children. And this <clears throat> second point, you do not need even to think with a glimpse of, of an eye, that immune suppressed individuals quickly succumb to the parasitic infections. You also have acquired immunity in laboratory models which have been demonstrated against the uh, parasites. And this shows an evidence that really, yes, the uh, immune system can respond to parasitic infections. And then I told you, I want to come now to first of all the tissue damage before I go to in-depth uh, uh, elaboration of the immune response to the parasite. So how do parasites damage the host? They damage the host by competing for nutrients like the, the tapeworms. Tapeworms, you know, the uh, typical organs which are affected. So in so doing, uh, they compete for nutrients with the host. And in that case, the host will be uh, malnourished. So in that case, you find the tissues getting damaged. Hydatid uh, disease is caused because of the disruption of the tissues. And this is also a manifest of the tissue damage in the parasitic infections. I've mentioned to you about the destruction of the cells, the red blood cells because of malaria. You also have hookworms and cystosomiasis, which can result in the destruction of the target cells. When we were young, we used to get quite much infection with the Ascaris lumbricoids. So the Ascaris lumbricoids do a blockage of the intestines and they particularly the small uh, intestines and the large intestines. And it is very scary. You people have not gone through this, perhaps some have. Very scary by the time you develop that uh, critical stomachache and you are given the medicines which trigger the motility of the uh, intestines. And by the time the Ascaris lumbricoids get out of your body, they get out like that. It is very scary. Maybe uh, you, some of you, I would doubt, uh, could have had such kind of an experience. So in case of the severe disease, uh, the inflammatory component, and largely I want to mention to you here, which you must not forget, that the tissue damage which is caused in the parasitic infections is largely because of inflammatory response. The reason being we learned just shortly that parasites are large uh, organisms, except those ones like the uh, uh, malaria parasite, which infects the red blood cells. Ascari will soon because if you talk about say the hookworm, they're so large. And in that case, the uh, phagocytosis is not quite um, prominent in immune response to these parasites. Hence, what will be triggered is the inflammatory response, like I mentioned to you, to clear out Ascaris lubricants from the intestinal tract, there is a trigger of uh, intestinal motility. And how does this intestinal motility is triggered? The medicine which is given will trigger inflammation. So by line, the tissue damage will result from the inflammatory response that is triggered in the immune response to these pathogens. 
Continued on the immunopathology, we have got the cerebral malaria, which is resulting from excess release of tumor necrosis factor interferon and other pro-inflammatory cytokines, which can now spill into the brain. So this is what is causing constant uh, cerebral malaria when you get infection with the parasite. You also have hepatosplenic cystosomiasis, which can uh, really cause granuloma and fibrosis. And this terms you are now quite familiar with, the fibrosis of the tissue will ensure non-function of the tissue. And when there is a granuloma, as you learned about it during your learning of the immune response to intracellular bacteria, particularly the TB antigen, there is a formation of that giant cell which now hinder the uh, functioning of the tissue where it is lodged. We also have oncosasiasis, um, which is anti uh, microfilarial response in the eye. And this can really result in blindness when you are infected with the parasite. Again, you can have anaphylactic shock, and this can lead to rupture of hydatid cyst and also result in uh, immediate hypersens uh, hypersensitivity reaction when you are infected by these parasites. We don't forget that there can also be nephropathy where immune complexes are deposited in the glomerular basement membrane of the kidney. And this is typical example of the chronic malaria as well as the infection with the uh, cystosomiasis. So then we come to immune response because I told you uh, learning objectives have switched them, uh, swapped them a bit. We've gone through the immunopathology before we come now to immune response. But either way, which uh, question somebody may test your understanding with, when you come to your learning objectives, you need to know the pathogen in question, come to the immune response to it, then come to the immunopathology of it, then lastly come to the immune response, which is uh, adapted to that uh, pathogen in question. So when we come to the immune response to protozoans, and uh, as parasites, protozoans will induce the innate immune response. And this is likely because they are extracellular. We have extracellular protozoan, which are usually eliminated by phagocytosis. But like I've mentioned to you, parasites are large or, uh, organisms, and therefore phagocytosis sometimes can be uh, limited in the immune response to clear them out. In that case, what will be important, therefore, is the activation of the complement system and resulting in them membrane attacking complex generation, which will now therefore be able to clear out the, uh, the pathogen. When we come to acquired immune response, we can have some element of antibody plus complement activation. But like I mentioned to you, the parasites uh, most of the time require induction of the inflammatory response. So in this case, for the T cell response, there would be extracellular protozoa, which is indu inducing the T helper 2 cytokine release and also antibody production. But antibodies will not help much more except binding to those pathogens and therefore activating the complement. Intracellular protozoa will activate cytotoxic lymphocyte reaction, typical examples of malaria parasite, because therefore that cell which is infected by plasmodium falcipara need to be eliminated. How is it eliminated? With the cell mediated cytotoxicity. Which cell is involved? The cytotoxic T cell. Of course, now I've mentioned the point too, that antibody being produced will be able to activate the complement and cause membrane attacking complex, which can do, which can carry out lysis of the blood uh, dwelling trypanosomes. You must note that activated macrophages effective against intercellular protozoan, like I've given example here, Les Leishmania, Toxoplasma, type of Trypanosoma cruzi can simply be able to clear out that pathogen. But nonetheless, we have got limited uh, phagocytosis which occur in immune response to parasitic infections. Therefore, the cells which will be important are activated uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells which will cause uh, cell mediated cytotoxicity. And I've given you a typical example with the plasmodium infected uh, cells. Expanding on the acquired immune response, if we look at antibody responses, I mentioned to you that critical thing is the activation of the complement, but not only activation of the complement, we can have activation of the complement only when opsonization has occurred. So opsonization simply means attaching to the um, uh, uh, component or the uh, epitope antigenic determinant of 
this parasite and in that case therefore what will follow is the complement activation so antibodies being produced again as a cellular protozoa will opsonize which means attaching to the epitope of that parasite then activating the complement but the antibody can also induce antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity in this case the cytotoxic t cell the cytotoxic cell which will come handy is the um, natural killer cell not the cytotoxic t cell again we have got the antibody response to intercellular protozoa we have neutralization and this can occur when the body producing neutralizing antibodies which prevent the sporozoites from entering the liver cells. So this would be sporozoites which are produced and in circulation would be targeting the liver cells. Before it targets or enters the liver cells, the antibodies which are produced will serve as neutralizing antibody and will prevent the entry of these sporozoites into the uh, liver cells. We categorized the parasites into protozoans and helminths. So we've cleared out with the immune response to protozoans, and we now we go to immune response to helminth infections. And most of the helminths are extracellular organisms. The reason being they're too large for phagocytosis. Some may be gastrointestinal nematodes and would only induce the inflammation and also hypersensitivity. This is triggered, you definitely know right now what hypersensitivity type one is triggered by the degranulation of the eosinophils and also mediated purely by the production of the immunoglobulin E as the antibody which triggers the, uh, the hypersensitivity reaction. And this will result in inflammatory response and can occur in the intestines or in the lungs. So in most of the time, you'll find out the production of the histamine when the immunoglobulin E has been active, uh, produced and uh, binding to the mast cells and triggering the degranulation producing the pro-inflammatory mediators, which will elicit the production of histamine. Histamine, you know, is a pro-inflammatory mediator. And this will typically result into allergic reaction. So do we have uh, immune response to helminth infection? The only response, two responses which categorize, you can have acute response because like I mentioned to you here, the innate immune response is what will be much more important here because this cell, this, this immune, these parasites uh, are large in size. So phagocytosis is quite uh, uh, limited and even killing them directly by T cytotoxic cells is limited. So what will occur, you'll have got the first, uh, I mean, uh, um, short period following the exposure, there will be acute response mediated by inflammatory response. And this can nonetheless uh, expel the worms from the body. But then when there is uh, over time stay of this uh, helminth in the body, it will trigger what is called the chronic uh, uh, inflammation. And this chronic inflammation will result into what is called activated macrophages, building together or not piling together, forming what is called a granuloma, a giant cell of activated macrophages. If they lodge into a tissue, then they will really disrupt the functioning of that tissue. We also have the uh, chronic exposure can also trigger T helper 2 or B cell responses, which still will result in the increase of immunoglobin E and mast cell degranulation and also eosinophils. everything resulting to what? Inflammation. So we understand most of the time what we are talking about here in immune response to parasitic infection is the inflammatory response. And helminths can also induce like T helper 2 response everything still results in the production of interleukin-4, interleukin-5, still rolling around the production of immunoglobin E, which is uh, hinged to the inflammatory response. Even if you talk about the antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, which can direct the killer cells to the pathogen itself, they still will only result in eosinophil killing of the parasite by inflammatory-mediated immunoglobin E production. And then when we go to the parasite, parasite immune evasion mechanism, a number of strategies have been uh, uh, adapted 
And I need students to be a bit too keen. Don't just sit there and do not, don't read. You know, these internet issues have made things like you are attached to internet without looking at the textbooks which have been published by several authors to dig information. So you keep juggling. When somebody asks you about evasion mechanism of the parasites, somebody tells me about the, the antigenic, antigenic mutation. And when you ask them about immune evasion mechanisms by the viruses, they come and tell you antigenic shift. Do you understand the reason, the, the two terms, antigenic shift and mutation? So I'm not going to dwell much on it because I would believe you had covered immune response to viral infections, but sometimes go to the library and pick textbook, open it. You don't just be glued so much into the, what the internet is telling you and then it makes you have difficult distinguishing what is antigenic sh shift, what is an antigenic drift, how does it relate to mutation? Right now you have coronavirus, which is a, a viral pathogen. These viruses mutate a lot, which means each time they keep on changing their antigens. That is mutation, not antigenic shift or antigenic drift. Parasites adopt much more of antigenic shift and drift, not mutation. Okay, now let's start our points. Parasites will need time in the host. And uh, in this so doing, the development uh, uh, reproduce and ensure vector transmission. So this way, you would find out that there is resulting chronic uh, infection, which can be considered as normal. Let me, let me take you back to point number one, that by requiring time in the host to establish infection, the immune system more or less would be confused. Please, that is a good scientific term to use. Immune system would be confused and with time can typically um, assume that the parasite is part of the body. And again, point number two, you can have chronic infection and with the chronic infection, the immune system is weakened on one hand, but again, with the chronic infection, at one point, the, after exhaustion of the immune system, the immune system will no longer respond to these parasites. And therefore the parasite will establish an infection and cause pathology in the body. Again, parasites have evolved a variety of immunization strategies which we are going to look at here. One is the uh, antigenic uh, variation, which we are going to talk now shortly. But one, we can talk about anatomical seclusion in vertebrate host. And examples which are given here is Plasmodium falciparum, which I've mentioned to you, reside inside the red blood cells. And when the, red blood, when the infected red blood cells are not able to present the uh, antigen, thanks to the lack of the nucleus and therefore cannot ex express major histocompatibility complex molecules, they would be therefore killed by cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells as target cells. So target cells will require cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Another example is Leishmania parasites and Trypanosoma cruzi, which live inside the macrophages. Now, if they establish the uh, life inside the macrophages, which means they would be residing in the cytoplasm and fail to be presented bound to major to compatibility complex plus two molecules, which can now be recognized by the T helper cells. Then we have got antigenic uh, variation. This slide seems too busy. I want to go only through these three points that uh, uh, antigenic variation, you know, the life cycle of plasmodium falcifera from the um, uh, sporozoite stage to the level stage, then to mature uh, plasmodium falcifera stage. And each point from the red blood cells to passing through the liver cells, the parasite express different stages in the life cycle and express different antigens. In this case, the immune system will be exhausted in recognizing which uh, antigen to re respond to. And if it wants to respond to a sporo sporozoite stage, then you find the parasite has shifted to a different stage. You know the life cycle plus more of I implore you to go look at it. And this is typically a um, uh, strategy which is used by plasmodium falciparum to evade immune system because the different stages of life cycle express different antigens. We also have antigenic variation uh, uh, typical of Giardia lamblia. And with this antigenic variation, it rolls back into the immune system will not be able to respond to all these uh, antigens adequately because there is variation all the time.
And you have got African trypanosomes one surface glycoprotein that covers the parasite, the, 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 the trypanosome, and it has what is called variant surface glycoprotein, VSG. And uh, these many points which are down here, I don't want to go into two. what I want to show you is with this variant surface glycoprotein, there is fluctuation of the immune system. Yes, this is what I mean. So I'm not sure if you're seeing my cursor. At one point, you would be seeing that the, uh, the parasite infects the host and the immune system contains it until there is a new variant of the antigen expressed. So there is be parasitemia and increase of the parasite in the body system and the immune system contains it. It comes down, parasitemia, then the, it shoots up again. What causes this is variant surface glycoprotein, which is expressed by this um, pathogen. And in so doing, it keeps on derailing the immune response to contain the pathogen fully. So what I mentioned up here is the variant surface glycoprotein expressed by African trypanosome 1 is what is triggering this fluctuation in parasitemia, ensuring the uh, spike in the parasite in the body. And then when the immune system recognizes that variant antigen, it contains it and it keeps on fluctuating, fluctuating. Now, other mechanisms which have been explored by the parasites include shedding or replacement of surface uh, uh, antigen. Example is entamoeba histolytica or immunosuppression, like I mentioned to you, the plasmodium falciparum, or you have anti-immune mechanisms employed by Leishmania antioxidase to counter macrophage oxidative burst. And for the case of the helminth uh, immune uh, evasion mechanisms, I mentioned to you, gave you example only of this Ascaris lumbricoid, which is so large in size, and this makes it very difficult to eliminate. So the primary response which will ensure its elimination is inflammation, which will trigger the motility of the gastrointestinal tract, and therefore the worm will be eliminated. The mechanisms which are employed by the helminths include coating with host proteins. And if that happens, therefore the immune system will not be recognizing the pathogen as a foreign, but as, it's, as, as a host part component, and will therefore ensure evasion of the immune response. So the immunological appearance of the host tissue will uh, camouflage the para, 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 pathogen itself or the helminth itself. And in this case, the, uh, anti, uh, the, the immune system will not be able to respond to it. So worms will be seen here just as cells and they will be circulating the body system as normal. There's also molecular mimicry employed by cystosomes. And this is typical of the expression of E selectin and also addition molecules, which ensure that the parasite can be able to invade the host uh, tissue. Other mechanisms include the atomical, uh, anatomical seclusion and also the shedding or replacement of the surface antigens as is seen by the trematodes and also the hookworms. The immune suppression is also a typical mechanism but that is employed by the helminths to uh, evade the immune system. And in this case, the parasite itself may be secreting anti-inflammatory antigens, and this will suppress the recruitment and activation of the vector leukocytes, or on the other hand, block the chemokine receptor interaction, and therefore the parasites will not be recognized easily. Typical example of such kind of um, uh, helmin is the hookworm, which binds to beta integrin and C-reactive and chemokine receptor 2 and inhibits neutrophil extra position. We also have anti-immune mechanisms employed by liver fluke and these secrete enzymes that may leave the antibodies which will target to respond to it or the migration of hookworms which move about in the gut and in this case can avoid local inflammatory response like we mentioned are critical uh, points for the elimination of the uh, helminths. And you know of this, the uh, um, filarial parasites which can secrete antioxidant enzymes and this is quite difficult, therefore, to uh, induce the antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity and oxidative burst, which can clear out the, uh, the, the, the parasite. So in this case, the parasite itself is producing parasite enzymes, 
and these enzymes they, uh, act as antioxidant and blocks antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity as well as oxidative burst which would be uh, induced. So summary number one is that the helminths would evade the immune system through size uh, using host proteins, I've mentioned that molecular mimicry, anatomic seclusion, surface shedding of the uh, antigens or the replacement of the um, uh, antigens which will be recognized. We have immunosuppression or anti-immune uh, mechanisms like we've seen with the filarial worms or migration from one point to another in the body system and also production of enzymes which will block the oxidative burst. How about immune response to fungal infections? Uh, fungi, although a huge number of fungi exist in the world, only a small number can cause disease. Why? Because most of these disease-causing fungal infections are opportunistic pathogens. Why are they opportunistic pathogens? Because they would only cause disease under circumstances, and such kind of circumstances are when the immune system becomes weakened, like in patients who are immunocompromised. Are we together? Yes, we are. Are we together? Okay, so I would want to repeat this slide because it is key for your understanding of how the fungal infections uh, soon, I think uh, you are in second year, soon when you reach third, fourth year, you'll be um, uh, going through the clinical pharmacology and you'll be understanding how difficult it is to treat fungal infections. But then when fungal infections occur, you need to understand that they occur in the background of the immunosuppression. They, a lot of them exist on the, in, in the world, but only a few will be causing disease and in only circumstances where there is uh, uh, immunosuppression. Hence, we call them opportunistic pathogens. And fungi can cause lots of different types of infections. And I've given you a table just below in the next slide, which we'll go through because it is not long. And these uh, uh, different types of infections would range from common skin infection to mucosal infections to serious life threatening sepsis and also organ failure when it is not treated on time. But in either case, there are few treatments which are available and there are no vaccines available so far for the fungal infections. Now this, Third point I've just resonates with my earlier statement that soon we are picking up now the clinical pharmacology and you'll understand how difficult it is to treat fungal infections. If your dosage is not correct and if the age target you don't uh, capture well, if the weight of the patient you don't capture well, you will not be able to treat that fungal infection. And some fungal uh, species and the type of infections they cause, you have got the more common one, you have got the candida, and candida cause va valvovaginal um, infection. And you also can have uh, oral candidiasis, mouth infection, typical uh, when you have got immunocompromised patients. Or sometimes you can have the disseminated candidiasis, which now can cause the sepsis. You must not uh, underrate the Aspergillus fumigatus, which is also invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, you can cause as pulmonary aspergillosis. And this is typical lung infection, which is very difficult to treat and also occur commonly in patients who are immunocompromised. Who does not know about pneumocystis carinae? The typical manifestation of the HIV uh, AIDS infection because of the immune system not able to contain the 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 pneumocystic carinae. So you know, more, more common diagnosis of pneumocystic carinae, yes, it can occur as um, exposure, even in immunocompetent patients, but most of the time, you like I mentioned to you, these fungal infections are quite common in immunocompromised patients. Another example is the Cryptococcus pneumophomans, which is uh, common also in the lung infection and can also cause meningitis. So what innate immune responses could be mounted against this fungal infection? There is recognition by the dendritic cells and macrophages. So these are, are phagocytic cells and antigen presenting cells. So once they bind to the uh, epitope or antigenic determinants on the cell walls of the pathogen, they do this through the path pattern recognition receptors and they will be able to attempt to uh, carry out phagocytosis. But again, how, how is phagocytosis uh, possible if you have got a ringworm? I mean, that dendritic cell is 
would be very bold because it cannot, it cannot, of course, it was anything if there is a ringworm which has affected the skin. So it tells you here that, yes, there is recognition of these pathogens by the uh, phagocytes, but it has inherent limitation in completing the phagocytic process, which should be ending up in either oxygen-dependent killing or oxygen-independent killing. Then we also have the selecting uh, receptors, which can be able to recognize these pathogens, and uh, particularly important for uh, pattern recognition receptors in antifungal immunity. But again, uh, several other uh, uh, pattern recognition receptors are also involved, which include toll-like receptors, they recognize this uh, fungal infection, which is very good, but they cannot complete the phagocytosis, which should end up in the killing of the pathogen. So the recognition will be so good. You have got toll-like receptors, you have got dectin too, you have got the other molecules which we're able to recognize and the dectin. So all this builds to the innate uh, effector mechanism of the elimination of this, uh, of this, uh, fungi uh, before they establish an infection in a cell. But like I gave you a typical example, you have got a ringworm which has infected the skin. I mean, where would be the role of these dendritic cells? They cannot really phagocytose them and ensure killing of the pathogen or the fungi. So then there is need of adaptive immune system to in, uh, fungal infections, which also have to an extent some limitation. And what will only happen is the uh, killing through the inflammatory responses which are induced. Like here, the um, yeah, interferon, uh, uh, interferon gamma uh, produced by the T helper one, or you have got interleukin 17, or these are uh, inflammatory cytokines, which can induce killing through an inflammatory process. And at sometimes you have got the granulocyte cells like the neutrophils, which would be able to produce granules and these granules can act against the fungal infections. So many selecting receptors uh, can also be used the, in the signaling uh, of this uh, uh, cascade of immune response to fungal infections. And in turn, they will in, uh, recruit what is called the CAD9, the caspase recruitment domain containing protein. And this will activate the antifungal immune response. And therefore, the deficiency of this caspase recruitment domain containing protein, uh, protein 9, because the C lectin receptors were not able to activate them, would typically lead to the susceptibility to fungal infection and because there would be lack of the innate signaling coming from the C-lectin receptors, indicated there, CLR. C-lectin, C-lectin, I didn't indicate up there, but these are uh, lectins, the uh, molecules which would be uh, using signals to activate the caspase uh, pathway. And the caspase pathway can now lead to the um, uh, elimination of the, the fungal infection. Do we have any adaptive immunity to uh, fungal infection adequately? No. Even if we have got the antibody production, which is not important here, we have got the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which will be able to kill fungal infected cells, but only before the fungi establishes infection inside the cell. And like I typically keep on repeating, giving you the, uh, the ringworms, uh, which uh, predominate the infection of the skin. So in this case, even though the cytotoxic T lymphocytes would be important, and also the activated macrophages as cell-mediated cytotoxicity inducing cells, they have got inherent limitation in clearing out the fungal infection from the body system. And fungal uh, immune evasion uh, mechanisms, one point is that they can modulate the amount of certain uh, cell wall components of the, uh, of the susceptibility uh, of the immune system to reach them. So in a bid to avoid the immune response, the fungal infections will modulate the amount of cell wall components which they can uh, expose to the immune uh, system or they will limit the accessibility of this immune system to this cell wall. 
of the fungi. And in this case, the fungal uh, surface will be uh, will, will not be recognized by the immune system. They can also bypass the encounter with immune cells and fungi have been known to develop what is called a hiding strategy by covering themselves with typical example, beta one, three gluten or chitin with uh, different uh, molecules. And in covering themselves, it resonates back to what you are understanding of the parasite that sometimes they can coat their surface with the molecules of the host and in return would not be able to be recognized by the immune system. So summary number two, we have got fungal infection, which is common in children due to the immune system, which is still evolving. And I've told you, it is also common in the older um, uh, population, geriatric population. The simple reason is uh, their immune system uh, has, is now weakened because of age. But also the fungal infection is quite common in immunocompromised patients. And a typical example is the uh, patients who are uh, undergoing through uh, AIDS phase uh, following the HIV infection. And both innate and adaptive immune responses are activated against fungal infection, which is true, but we have got inherent limitation of the effectiveness to clear out the fungal infection. To that point, then we have covered the immune response to parasitic and fungal infection, covering the identity of the parasite itself, the immunity to that parasite itself, how the pathogen is inducing pathology, immunopathology related to parasitic and fungal infection. And we've seen how the immune system responds to it, innate and adaptive. And we've seen the strategies which are adopted by the uh, parasite and the fungal to evade the immune response. Any question? Any question, any part a student wants me to clarify further? All right, if we are cool, then you can um, enjoy your day. Hey, hey. Uh... Excuse me. Yes, talk loud. Uh, I just have a question on the selective receptors. I wouldn't hear that part. Talk loud. I'm saying mm -hmm. question on the part of the selecting receptors. Like I didn't mm -hmm. get that part well. Yeah. We are here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I was explaining here is the role of adaptive immunity to fungal infections, which I mentioned. You can have the helper T cells. Now, if you don't have helper T cells, the C lectins, uh, you know, the C, this, these are um, proteins produced by the liver. If you could have uh, covered the complement system, I tend to think you have covered. Manos lectin pathway, did you cover? Yes. Activation of complement system through lect manoselectin pathway. Yes. Yes, so these are uh, C-lectins and they have got what is called the receptor. These C-lectin receptors are expressed on the surface of the pathogens. So they would induce the what is called caspase recruitment domain containing protein in the host. So the C-lectins are uh, molecules which will induce another molecule to activate antifungal immune response. But when you link it up, therefore, with the complement activation through manos lectin pathway, it will come out clear to you that they work in a cascade. The lectin molecules will be able to activate the CAD, and the CAD will be able to activate now the antifungal immune response. Excuse me, Doc. Um, could you yes. kindly cap on how you, you, you say you talked about uh, how the immune system is uh, limited uh, in fighting fungal infections? Will you, yeah, you I just gave you a typical point? I just gave you a typical example in fighting fungal infection. Here, what we came to understand here, we have got C type like uh, lectin receptors, and these are important in like pathogen recognition receptors, and they can induce antifungal immunity. Because when we talk about all like receptors, we talk about uh, pathogen recognition um, uh, receptors, all builds back into carrying out the phagocytosis because it is done through dendritic and the macrophages, right? 
Now I gave you uh, only one example of a fungal infection, the, uh, the ringworm. Okay, and ringworm more or less uh, affects the skin, right? And at the skin, yes, you'll have the um, underlying of the skin, the presence of the dendritic and macrophages which would carry out the phagocytosis. But once the skin itself, the skin cells themselves uh, are in, uh, infected, by the fungal, the dendritic cells will not really uh, phagocytose the whole cell because they needed to target only the, uh, the fungal infection. But once the fungi has now invaded the skin uh, cells, it would be difficult for them to phagocytose a skin cell. These are phagocytic cells and uh, skin cells is an epithelial cell. So you know of the spread of the fungal, uh, of the ringworm from one uh, epithelial cell to another epithelial cell. So there's going to be inherent difficulty of this dendritic and uh, macrophages to phagocytose an epithelial cell. You got it? Yes, thank you. So therefore, what would be attempted is um, the uh, inflammation and inflammation which is now ensuring that cytotoxic T cells are activated and cytotoxic T cells activated would now destroy the epithelial cells which have been infected. But then the cytotoxic T cells cannot be activated on their own. They need help from the T helper cells which will produce inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma and also interleukin 17, which are pro-inflammatory mediators. And I've indicated here also, we have got neutrophils and neutrophils you know, are granulocytic cells. So they would be producing granules which can act against the fungal infection. But by far, what example I can give you which is quite clear is the ringworm, which is difficult to clear out because it is not easy to phagocytose the epithelial cell by a phagocytic cell. In fact, that is a correct statement I've now made. So the CD8 positive T cell, if it is activated, it will be able and also activated macrophages. These two cells are key in cell-mediated cytotoxicity and also natural killer cell. You could have learned about cell-mediated cytotoxicity. These cells will kill now that epithelial cell. Kill, they carry out killing. How do they carry out killing? The macrophages and the natural killer cells kill through non-specific mode. The macrophages will kill through production of the enzymes, as well as the CD8 positive T cell kill through production of enzymes, granzymes, and also perforins. Perforins, which will cause pore onto that target cell, epithelial cell, which has been infected, and now um, uh, incapacitating the existence of that cell. So that cell will die. Any other question? Right, I see it is one minute to eight. Maybe you can prepare yourself for the next classes you have. The class rep, these notes I will send you in the course of the in the course of the day. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Good day. <laughs>